There's great power in self-reliance. Self-reliance means you simply look mostly to yourself. It would be nice if someone just gave you this, gave you this, gave you this. It would be nice if everyone did their job exactly as they're supposed to do it. But here's what you've got to do. Primarily rely on yourself. Primarily say, I'm the person responsible. And I will learn the necessary skills so that I can help people learn their skills. If I need lots of people to do certain things to build my organization, that is what I must have. But I've got to be the final backstop. I've got to be the final one that people can rely on. So that if this is missed and this is missed, I can catch up, I can fill the gap, I can do the job. We have to do it when we conduct meetings. We have to do it when we conduct training. We have to do it when we're in a class of just a few. What someone might have missed, we're there to fill in. Self-reliance. Primarily, we're learning to count on yourself. So that you can do this, never complain and never explain. Here's the next key power, and that's image. There's many parts to image. The image that others see you as, the image you have with other people. And it's very important how other people see you. If they don't see you as a leader, chances are they won't pay attention. If they don't see you as being in control, chances are they won't have the trust. If they don't see you as knowing where you're going, what you want to accomplish, they probably won't follow. But if people can see you, if you have the image of someone that's in charge, in control, in control of your life, your future, your destiny, in control of the situation, if they see that, that kind of image is powerful. It helps to win the day, it attracts other people. People want to be around people that are in control, that are powerful, but they know how to use their power, influential, but they know how to use their influence. That kind of image is important. But here's a very important image, and that is your image of yourself. The way you dress, the way you talk, the way you think, your capacity for learning, all of that is an important image that you have of yourself. The image that you have that if it needs to be learned, you could learn it. If there's a book that needs to be mastered, you could master it. If there's a skill that needs to be learned, why couldn't you get busy now and learn that skill? That kind of self-image, that I am continually trying my best to be the best I can. Because one of the most important places you have to look is into the future, yes. You got to look into the past, yes. You've got to look around, yes. But one of the most important places you have to look is in the mirror. Goals are important for a genuinely success-oriented person. Without them, you're just playing around. The difference between a goal-directed individual and someone without goals is like the difference between a Wimbledon champion and a kid batting a tennis ball around on a court with non-at. No opponent to bring out the best in him and no way of keeping score. Despite everything that's been written about the importance of goal setting, very few people actually put it into practice. It's always amazed me the way the average person devotes more thought and effort to planning his or her two week vacation than to planning his life. Goals represent challenge in its most positive form. Leaders have their personal goals as well as those of their organization clearly in focus. In fact, one of the principal responsibilities of leadership is defining goals for the vast majority of people who aren't able to do it for themselves. Over the years, I've developed some ideas about effective goal setting, and I'd like to share those with you. But I also want to point out some traps of goal, directed behavior that aren't usually talked about, but certainly ought to be. When I was a kid, I used to dream what it would be like to buy a ticket on a train and just go someplace. I didn't really think about where I'd be going or how long it would take to get there. I just loved the idea of getting on the train and letting it take me someplace. I guess there's still something appealing about that idea, but it's not really the way you should live your life as a mature human being. When you grow up, you buy a ticket on a train or a plane because you want to go someplace and you know exactly where you're going. You may have to change planes in a different city. 
your flight may be canceled or you may have to switch to another flight. You may not feel like talking to the person seated next to you, but you will persist. You know where you're headed and you're quite determined to get there. That's goal, directed behavior in its simplest form. There are short-term goals and long-term goals. Sometimes you're flying across the country. Other times, you're just walking down to the corner grocery store. Long-term goals are the equivalent of a major journey. When you reach the point where you've achieved your long-term goals, your life will be fundamentally changed, and the process of getting to that point will have transformed you into a stronger, wiser, and higher performing person. How can you identify your long-term goals? On a sheet of paper or in a notebook, write these five headings. One, what do I wanna do? Two, who do I wanna be? Three, what do I wanna see? Four, what do I wanna have? Five, where do I wanna go? Under each of these categories, write down several possible long-term goals. Be very relaxed about this. Just allow your mind to flow and come up with three to six ideas for each category. Don't worry about a lot of details at this point and don't spend too much time describing a particular goal. For example, refer to category one. Suppose you wanna write a book about the history of your family going back to the arrival of your great grandparents in the United States. Just quickly jot down family history. Then it occurs to you that you've always wanted to see the pyramids in Egypt, so you write pyramids. Keep writing down ideas as long as the list of categories continues to inspire you. You'll probably be surprised at some of the things that turn up. You may have kept a great many desires and aspirations hidden in the back of your mind, but the opportunity to write them down will move them to the forefront of your consciousness. That's one of the benefits of this technique. When you're satisfied with your list of long-term goals, read through the list once again. Then beside each item, write the number of years that you believe it will take you to achieve that particular goal. It's best to round off the numbers into one year, three year, five year, and 10 year time frame. For example, you may estimate that it will take you 10 years to research and write the book on your family history, but you'll need only five years to reach a position where you can take a trip to the pyramids. Create a time frame like this for every one of your long-term goals. When you're finished entering your time frames, there should be a fairly balanced distribution for all your goals. If there are many one and three year objectives, but only a few in the 10 year category, maybe you need to think more about what you really want your life to add up to. What kind of life you really want to build over the long run. But if there's a preponderance of 10 year goals and relatively few of the shorter term variety, this may be an indication that you tend to put things off. Keep working on your list, adding and subtracting goals with various time frames until you've created a more or less even distribution. Now comes the really challenging and interesting part. So far, you've just been adding things to the list, but now it's time to start making some selections. Now you're going to start asking yourself, it's really important compared to what might just be fun. Choose four goals from each of the four time frames. One year, three year, five year and 10 year. You now have 16 separate goals. So far, you've only referred to them in shorthand fashion, but now you're going to start seeing them very clearly in your mind's eye. You're going to see each goal just as if it were being realized this very minute, and you're gonna write down a detailed description of exactly what you see. Do you intend to open a handmade furniture store in three years? What will the store look like from the street? Will there be gold leaf lettering on the windows or will there be a sign hanging over the door instead? How many square feet will the store contain? Will there be a showroom area for the furniture in front and a workspace in back? Or will the furniture be built at a different location? Do you intend to have any employees or will you run the business entirely by yourself? Think of all the questions that need to be answered in order to see your goal with absolute clarity and then write the information down. That written record will become one of your most important personal possessions. But that's not all. 
Any goal is a powerful motivator only if there's a powerful reason behind it. Why do you want to achieve your goals? Why do you want to own a handmade furniture store or a private airplane or a newspaper in a small town in Vermont? Why do you want to compete in a triathlon or visit the Australian Outback or be the first woman in your family to earn a PhD? Write down your reasons for wanting each goal in the same degree of detail that you use to write your descriptions. If you can't find a clear and convincing reason for each of your 16 goals, do some serious reevaluating. You may have more whims or pipe dreams than real goals, and now is the right time to make that discovery. Keep working on your list until you have 16 clearly envisioned, strongly motivating long-term goals. At regular intervals, review what you've written and keep careful track of your progress toward these objectives. Above all, persevere. Goal setting is a very important first step, but goal achievement is a continuous, lifelong process. That's what makes it so challenging. That's also why it's so extremely rewarding to finally attain your long-term goals. That I'm just asking you to begin something new in all the areas of your life. Maybe you've always thought about benevolence, and you just haven't gotten started, or you haven't made the plans, or you haven't made the decision. I'm asking you to start taking that stuff now that's in your head, that imagination, which is very powerful, and it's a great source of inspiration in itself. But then I'm asking you then to decide, use that inspiration. Then I'm asking you to make plans, begin to make plans, use that inspiration. And then if you take that first step, it can be the first step of an incredible journey. When Mark had his first meeting, when Mark recruited his first distributor, when Mark got that first few yeses from people and he started the process as simple as it was, you know, from the trunk of his car, you know, as, as crude as, as the literature was in the beginning, it was a start. And so beginning can be an incredible source of inspiration. And beginning can be many things, beginning a new commitment to learning. You say, I'm going to have a library second to none, and I bought the first book of my new library today. I'm going to be surrounded by information and inspiration. Uh, the cassette tapes and the videos and the books. I'm going to have a library second to none. Uh, I've thought about it. Wouldn't it be wonderful? And, uh, you know, I've, I've started making plans. You know, I provided some space in my room for my expanded library. Uh, but here's what's exciting. I got the first book today. I've gotten started. Uh, this is just the first of many, many books. This is the first uh, of a whole flow of information for me. This is the first time. Uh, you want to learn a new skill and you sign up for a class. Let's say you want to learn accounting or something and you, you sign up for the class and you take the first class. You get started. You thought about it. You made some plans for it. You made some time for it. But there's nothing like sitting there in the class with the pen in your hand and the pad ready to take notes. Here I am. I'm starting on a new journey of learning. Remember that. All the returns in life, whether in wealth, relationships, or knowledge, come from compound interest. Take business partners with high intelligence, energy, and above all, integrity. Don't partner with cynics and pessimists. Their beliefs are self-fulfilling. Learn to sell, learn to build. If you can do both, you will be unstoppable. Arm yourself with specific knowledge, accountability, and leverage. Specific knowledge is knowledge you cannot be trained for. If society can train you, it can train someone else and replace you. Specific knowledge is found by pursuing your genuine curiosity and passion rather than whatever is hot right now. Building specific knowledge will feel like play to you, but will look like work to others. When specific knowledge is taught, it's through apprenticeships, not schools. Specific knowledge is often highly technical or creative. It cannot be outsourced or automated. Embrace accountability and take business risks under your own name. Society will reward you with responsibility, equity, and leverage. Fortunes require leverage. Business leverage comes from capital, people, and products with no marginal cost of replication. 
code and media. Capital means money. To raise money, apply your specific knowledge with accountability and show resulting good judgment. Labor means people working for you. It's the oldest and most fought over form of leverage. Labor leverage will impress your parents, but don't waste your life chasing it. Capital and labor are permissioned leverage. Everyone is chasing capital, but someone has to give it to you. Everyone is trying to lead, but someone has to follow you. Code and media are permissionless leverage. They're the leverage behind the newly rich. You can create software and media that works for you while you sleep. Leverage is a force multiplier for your judgment. Judgment requires experience, but can be built faster by learning foundational skills. There is no skill called business. Avoid business magazines and business classes. Study microeconomics, game theory, psychology, persuasion, ethics, mathematics, and computers. Reading is faster than listening. Doing is faster than watching. You should be too busy to do coffee while still keeping an uncluttered calendar. Set and enforce an aspirational personal hourly rate. If fixing a problem will save less than your hourly rate, ignore it. If outsourcing a task will cost less than your hourly rate, outsource it. Work as hard as you can, even though who you work with and what you work on are more important than how hard you work. Become the best in the world at what you do. Keep redefining what you do until this is true. There are no get-rich-quick schemes. Those are just someone else getting rich off you. Apply specific knowledge with leverage, and eventually you will get what you deserve. When you're finally wealthy, you'll realize it wasn't what you were seeking in the first place.